Today is the solemnity of Corpus Christi, uh, where we celebrate the central mystery of our faith, uh, the source and summit, as it's called, uh, the body and blood of Jesus, the Eucharist. Uh, it's a medieval feast. Thomas Aquinas is the saint the doctor who gave the church uh, m many of the words of her prayers today. Uh, I always thought that if Thomas Aquinas was a Texan, he would have scheduled this feast not for the summer, uh, but rather uh, something like November, uh, especially with all the processions that normally attend Corpus Christi. To understand this beautiful solemnity, uh, you can begin by, by looking at the church calendar, the church year. Really, today's feast is uh, the culmination of, of the story which began way back in Advent. Uh, it's the story we, we hear and live every year. In Advent, of course, uh, the first... Uh, word we're given in this story is watch, you know. Uh, it's the first Sunday of Advent, watch, uh, because we are looking forward to the coming of Christ. Watch, repent, we hear the next week, prepare. Uh, we work toward that joyous moment in Advent, which brings us to Christmas, to... Um, see this wonderful thing like the shepherds, you know, the birth of Christ in the world. And, and, and we follow this Christ um, like the Magi, you know, they, they, they came to this uh, child Christ to adore him. And, and we learn from their worship that this Christ is, is not just a king, uh, but also Lord of the cosmos. We follow Christ in his ministry as the years and Sundays go on. Uh, we uh, follow him intensely in Lent. We watch as he is tempted in the desert and does battle with Satan. And we see him arrested. Uh, we watch him die and we're with the Magdalene when he rises from the dead. We watch him with the disciples ascend to heaven. We rejoice when the Spirit comes down upon us, just as he promised. Last week, it was a theological feast. It was the solemnity of the Holy Trinity, uh, the church was celebrating and reminding us that, that this Jesus, you know, who, who we have watched, uh, we, whom we've fallen in love with, he is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, Son of the Father, one with the Father, Holy Trinity. That's the story we have... Uh, as I've said, heard and, and lived since Advent, albeit in a very strange way this year. Today, the Feast of Corpus Christi, we celebrate, we remember, we learn that this Christ is here. This Christ whom, whom we've watched, in whom we have faith. He's, he's not far away. He's very, very close. He's on all the altars of the world. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of the age. Corpus Christi celebrates that truth. That in the bread and the wine become the body and blood 
of Christ on the altar. We touch this God. We ingest this God. He, he is inside of us. We consume him. Our God is not far away. In fact, he's very, very close. To understand this feast biblically, how I came to understand this feast first through scripture as a convert, you know, from Protestantism, I had to be sure about what these Catholics believed and did. To understand this feast, one must understand the scriptures which we just heard, which Lisa just read and Deacon Bob. We understand if, if, you, if you look at scripture, we understand that God sends at least the desert, has always fed his people manna to the Hebrews wandering in that barren desert. I've been there. It's a harsh place. Water from the rock. Again, if you spend any time in that desert, you would have understood that's a miracle. One thinks of, of, of Mount Sinai. The people gathered around to receive the law to be made Israel, to be cut into the covenant with God. You can read it in Exodus chapter 24. God calls Moses and some of the elders a little bit up the mountain. The covenant is ratified, and then, and then, there's a meal. There's that enigmatic line in verse 11. Takes your breath away, really. It says that the elders of Israel ate and drank and saw God. Beheld God. The Hebrew word is, is, is much like uh, the prophet's way of seeing It is the truth of Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And then what? You have set a table before me in the wilderness. God feeds his people. That's the eternal message of the word of God. God feeds his people, and, and, it, and it's that it's that which we must remember if we are going to understand anything about what Jesus uh, taught and did, especially in Capernaum in chapter 6. You've got to read the whole chapter. You've got to read the beginning of the chapter. It's a very long chapter. The beginning of chapter 6, uh, John tells us that Jesus fed the multitudes, you know, Miraculously, they, they had more bread and, and fish than anybody could ever want. It was, it, was, it was a miracle. John called it a sign. And those who, who saw it understood it. They, they, they knew that this Jesus was doing something like Moses did. Something like Elijah did in, in multiplying the loaves and in, in feeding these people like the Hebrews of old in, in the wilderness. Right at the end of that story, in the beginning of chapter 6, they, they try and seize him, try and arrest him, and, and, and make him Messiah, make him king. But as John says, uh, he eluded their grasp because he wasn't going to be a king like they thought Jesus should be a king. He wasn't going to be a Messiah the way they thought he ought to be a Messiah. Then comes the next story. The disciples get in the boat and go across the sea. Jesus doesn't get in the boat with them. Rather, he walks on water. He walks on water. John is... Uh, 
getting us to realize, you see, that yes, Jesus is, is the one like unto Moses, the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 18.15. He is the Messiah, but not like you think. This Messiah walks on water. This Messiah is Lord of creation. This Messiah is one with the Father. He is God. Thank you very much. Which sets up the conversation when they get on to the other side of the sea. They see this Jesus who didn't get in the boat with the disciples, get out of the boat with the disciples, and they ask him very mysteriously. It's it's full of mystery, this question in John. Jesus, uh, how did you get here? They're enraptured by by this mysterious Galilean. So Jesus starts talking about the bread. He, He says, you remember that bread that I fed you with just a while back? You remember that? Did you like that? There is better bread. Give us this bread always. You know, they 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 want this bread. Show us this bread. And it and it and it's at that moment. That moment, after these Hebrews who had been following Jesus, intrigued by this Jesus, these people who who have been fed on the truth of, of their of their religious and sacred history that God always feeds. Here's this prophet feeding us, and 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 he starts talking about bread. And he says. Seek the bread that endures for eternal life. Those of you who know anything about John's gospel will remember that when he was talking to that woman at the well, he he said to her, um, uh, search for the water which wells up for eternal life. Here he's saying, search for the bread that endures for eternal life. And then he says, I am the bread. I am the bread of life. And then he goes further. This is when they start murmuring. He says, my body is food. My my blood is drink. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have life and eternal life. He says, you must. He doesn't say it's an option. You must. And furthermore, he, he, he uses... Remarkable language. He, 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 the, he says you must chew, literally, you know. He, when, he, when he talks about his body, he, he uses the word for flesh. He could, have, he could have put it in more philosophical terms, but he didn't, you know. You must eat my flesh, my sarks in Greek. You must chew, you know. This is when they begin to, to drop like flies. That congregation in Capernaum, I, I know a little bit about that as a preacher losing people. Jesus lost a lot that day, you know. And Jesus n- never compromises. That's the thing. Um, he, he never lays off. He just keeps saying, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, the church would... Uh, later wrestle with that theology and and articulate that theology as best the church can. But at this point, for for most of us, uh, I would would just offer two things, three things. First, what the church says in the catechism, uh, in the Eucharist, Christ is really and mysteriously present. That's, that's what the Catechism says. In the Eucharist, Christ is really and mysteriously present. Then I'd, I'd remind you of what C.S. Lewis wrote once. He, C.S. Lewis pointed out, he said, you know, Jesus, uh, he just said, take, eat. He didn't say, take, understand which is what Jesus said in John's Gospel again and again and again, brothers and sisters. It's a matter of faith. But 
them to understand, and anybody who, who loves anyone else, any, anyone who is a parent understands this, why would God want to give his body and his blood, his real body and his blood, not just a symbol of it? Because a parent gives his child, a mother gives her son or her daughter everything. A father's entire self, a mother's entire self, that's what parents do, right? We empty ourselves for our kids. We give them everything, even when they're not grateful. Same sort of thing between anybody who really loves one another. Makes perfect sense to me on that level of love that Jesus would say, my body and my blood, you must eat it and drink it. And for that to be real. Then, then this, is, this is actually what brought me around to the cr full Christian faith of this, right? The Catholic faith of this mystery. If you read through the whole of the chapter, Jesus loses just about everybody, uh, probably everybody but the 12. And, and at the end, he, he, he doesn't turn around to his disciples and say, you know, uh, what do you, how do you think that went? Did I, did I mess it up? Should I have done it a different way? Um, no, he, he turns to his disciples and say, do you want to go too? There's the door. If all Jesus had to do to save those people from walking away, if all he had to do I, I, was, was to say, oh, it's just a symbol, you know. You misunderstand me. It's just a metaphor. It's just a ritual. If that's all Jesus had to say to bring those brothers and sisters back to him, I do believe that Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Shepherd of Souls, I do believe he would have done that, but he didn't, because he meant what he said. Which is why, uh, before you even get into theology, if you ever want to get into it, which is why I, as a, as a young believer, trying to get my head around it, it's that that made me start thinking, wow, this, this is something, this means something. There's something to it. That bread and wine truly, truly, truly becomes body and blood. And that is how God, across this world, sets tables in the wilderness for his people. Now, the one thing I should say um, before wrapping up is to, is to note and, and to acknowledge that, that these times are strange. I, I'm preaching to almost an empty church, you know. It's very awkward. Our doors for the good of public health like it or lump it, this is a smart thing we're doing. Our doors are closed. And we have to be honest about the weirdness of it, the pain of it. But let's remember two things. One, the Eucharist is still the Eucharist and God is still enthroned upon every Catholic altar on this planet. And that will not go away. It cannot be torn down. That truth will remain till kingdom come. And then two, I am, you are, 
everyone who is a believer, you are Eucharistic people. People born in the baptismal font, fed on Christ's flesh and blood, your heart, if you are a Eucharistic believer of Jesus Christ, your heart has been made an altar already. And so your desire for him, your prayer for him, your pain and your longing for him in the Eucharist, even though our doors are closed, because frankly, we don't want you to get sick. That might, with all due respect, that might just be the most beautiful, most powerful, most real Eucharistic prayer you've ever offered in your entire life. And the doors are locked. And God is made present on an altar just out of reach. Amen.